Hey there everybody, it's Mark Crilly. I'm back with another video. Today we're going to be doing one that I've been wanting to do for years. A video all about logos and giving you my best advice about designing logos and things that you want to think about, the whole process of it. Here you see the logo for my next book, The Mighty Onion, which is coming out uh, at the very beginning of April. Uh, and I'll be able to talk a little bit about that, but I'm going to just start by uh, coloring it in here. This is mainly something to give you guys uh, something to look at as I talk to you and give you my uh, best advice about designing logos. Uh, those of you who've been watching my videos for a while, you know that I've been in the business for quite a long time, since the mid-90s, and I've done a whole bunch of different books, each of which pretty much required its own logo. So I've got a fair amount of experience in this area, and hopefully I can give you some tips that'll help you when it comes to, design, to designing uh, logos of your own. Let's go ahead and jump in with the first piece of advice, and boy, is this one important. Number one. Your logo must be legible. Make sure people can read it easily, even from a distance or in thumbnail form. Now this is a, a rule that I feel applies to uh, lettering in general. I think these days with so many fonts to choose from and so forth, people can get a little carried away. And I have, even with my own projects, art directors have sometimes chosen fonts that I feel are very hard to read. Sometimes it's just one letter out of the alphabet that the font has chosen to do in a really weird way that makes it illegible. Um, that is just something to really think about. I consider it like the Hippocratic Oath, <laughs> you know, where doctors have to say, first, I pledge to do no harm. Um, I think with fonts or lettering, first, make it legible. The whole point of writing is for people to read it. I think sometimes we forget about that uh, and get super fancy and end up with uh, lettering that no one can read. So keep that in mind. This one, The Mighty Onion, definitely very uh, legible. And I must give credit where it is due. This is not my design. This was designed by uh, art director at Little Brown and Company named Ann Dwyer. So many thanks to Ann uh, for coming up with that uh, nice, bold, memorable logo. Anyway, maybe I can say a few more things about this as we continue working on it. But let's move on to number two. The logo is often the first impression people get of your project. Make sure it's a good one. Something that's memorable and visually appealing. Now, you know, that's sort of like easier said than done. What do you mean by memorable or visually appealing? I suppose in general this one is to tell you, you know, be careful when it comes to designing your logo because it really represents your project. And I'd say the main thing is to make sure that it's professional looking. When I see a logo that looks uh, a little amateurish, that gives me a sort of sour feeling about the whole uh, project. And, um, you know, again, it's all in the eye of the beholder, but I think amateurishness is, you know it when you see it. And, um, you know, towards the end of this video, we're going to get to my advice that is related to you know, other people's logos and logos that you admire. I think generally speaking, you'll find that those are professional, great looking logos and you can learn a lot from them, but we'll get to that later on. So yeah, keep that in mind. This really is the first thing that people see. It should not be undertaken lightly. You ought to give a lot of thought to it. And number three kind of relates to that, I think. Drawing your logo by hand requires exceptional skill. If yours looks unprofessional, considering, consider making use of fonts. Okay, so um, this is uh, something where I'm, for the purpose of this video, drawing a logo by hand. It is, of course, based on a logo that was probably, almost certainly not done by hand. It was uh, done uh, in some sort of a computer program. And so, you know, it's, I find myself in the position of saying this drawing that I'm doing for the purpose of this video is not what I would do uh, when, creating, <clears throat> when creating a font for a, a book that's going to go out into the world, especially these days. I have done uh, logos by hand, and perhaps we can start to get into examples uh, over the course of my career 
that uh, show you, uh, you know, logos that I've designed and I can tell you my thoughts about them. So hang on a second, I am going to go ahead and grab one of my books. The very uh, first thing that I came up with, we'll go through maybe the first three or four different projects uh, that uh, came along in my career and I'll say a thing or two about each one of them. Alright, so the very first uh, comic book that I created was called The Beast That Ate Morioka. It actually didn't get published until after uh, Akiko, but this logo actually is pulled from the very first page uh, right there, and you can see that it really was just a kind of a quick logo that I threw together to be um, the introduction of this uh, comic, and I would keep bringing it back because I, I kind of printed this out in installments. And again and again, you'd see that logo. So when it came time to finally turn it into a real comic book some years later, I basically took that exact same logo, uh, used Photoshop to make these letters look more three-dimensional. Uh, but otherwise, this is an example of a logo that maybe I didn't put enough time into. It's not super uh, professional looking. And uh, yeah, this is what might be a sort of cautionary tale. But I'm pleased to say that with my next... Uh, project that uh, I did, but probably the first project that anyone ever saw, uh, things started to improve in terms of professionalism. So the, I thought that the series or the book was going to be called Akiko on the Planet Smooth, and I came up with this logo that uh, is very much emphasizing the word smooth, which is the name of the planet. And you can see me getting fancy, trying to make something, uh, almost reminds me of uh, like the Yes, the old rock band. Uh, some of those fancy, uh, groovy-looking logos from the 70s. Um, but a uh, funny thing happened, as we went to press with this, uh, there was a publisher that owned the rights to a character called the Shmoo, and they sent us a letter of cease and desist because it was deceptionally confusing, and that's why we changed the series to Akiko, uh, which I think worked out for the best, or Akiko as a lot of people say. This actually was done by hand, but let me tell you, not at this size. Imagine this at maybe six, seven times the size, and that's how I did that, very carefully, trying to get all of the lines nice and thick, really laboring over the balance of all the letters and so forth. And I think here we can say that uh, I succeeded in creating a bold, memorable logo, and I think that's the real goal, something that is instantly recognizable, it's readable, of course, and um, as we're going to say uh, in future, um, you know, little bits of advice here, it gives you some sort of sense of the fun and approachable uh, feeling of this series. Well, that's kind of the first three logos, I suppose, that I designed, and that gives you some sense of what what my journey was early on and what my instincts were uh, as a creative person. Let's move on now to number four. Designing a logo usually requires multiple attempts. Don't settle for the first thing that pops into your mind. Now at this point, I want to talk about Brody's Ghost, which is a series that came along a good bit later but it ended up going through a lot of different revisions before we finally settled on a logo. I'm going to just clip this in. You're going to see a series of them in chronological order from the first proposed design until we finally got to the last one. Let's just have a look at them. So there you see the long process that led us finally to Brody's Ghost, the logo that went on uh, the series. Now, I didn't design this. This was designed by someone at Dark Horse Comics. Uh, they allowed me to sort of give my suggestions in terms of this green glow that's going around the edge of the letters. Um, but I have to uh, say that, you know, when you're working on a project that is um, published professionally, very often you don't have complete control over the logo and there's got to be some give and take. Uh, one of those logos you saw along the way there that was like primarily white and blue, that was my design, uh, what I proposed 
for the book to look like and uh, the publishers just weren't into it and so that one got left on the cutting room floor and we had to keep trying more and more different designs until we finally found one that we all agreed on. Now that is an example of a uh, hand done logo that was done with I would guess brush and ink uh, but you know this person had serious chops in terms of being able to do something by hand um, that looks professional. Uh, very often when something, when I can look at a logo and see right off the bat that it, w that it was done by hand and it doesn't look very good because of that, that's when I think, well, maybe we ought to leave this to the pros, you know, in terms of uh, doing something by hand versus uh, using a font. But I, uh, the key thing that we're talking about with this uh, piece of advice is that process of not going with the very first thing that pops into your head, but instead uh, taking your time, trying different things, trying different designs, working your way gradually toward a final result. I certainly do that when I'm coming up with uh, logos of any kind. Uh, and it, it, you know, you're not going to just take the first idea that pops into your head. You want to try different things and select the one that's really working. Um, let us move on now to the next piece of advice, a quite important one. Number five, your logo should convey the vibe of your story. It needs to match the tone and spirit of what your story delivers. Uh, this kind of goes along with that one that's about, you know, it's the first impression that people get. So you got to make sure that it matches and is an accurate representation of what the story is. Sometimes the logo, uh, if they haven't thought it through, is not a good representation. It has a different vibe from what the actual story is. Um, let me show you something that I did for my Mastering Manga series that really gets into this idea of matching the lettering to the vibe, to the atmosphere of the project. So here's Mastering Manga, my uh, one, two, and three book series that gives all of my best advice about creating uh, manga. And in my Mastering Manga 3, I have this section about designing your manga's logo. Now this first one here, uh, I used the word sample logo so that we don't focus too much on the title, but focus on the way that it's written. And this one is representing brushy lettering, very organic looking. This I think would fit with something about the days of the samurai or something like that. You're thinking about the vibe, the atmosphere, the feeling that you want people to get from it. So of course, for the next one, I've used futuristic lettering. Again, to sort of show you that the, the lettering, the style of the lettering gives off a certain vibe. This one would be great for a futuristic sci-fi kind of thing. Uh, and that involves this very clean, streamlined, uh, I guess they call it sans-serif, uh, modern-looking uh, lettering. And then finally down here I did fantasy lettering, and again, sample logo, and I've worked in a sword. Uh, it, this, of course, very sort of medieval-looking uh, lettering. Each one of these things is a choice that you're making in terms of conveying uh, to the viewer what type of story this is, and that's uh, why it is uh, uh, important for you to think about that before you design your logo. It is it's presenting the vibe, the general atmosphere of what your project is supposed to be. All right, well, I've gotten a little further ahead with my uh, coloring process here. Let's move on now to uh, number six, and that piece of advice is this. If you know what the cover art will look like, make sure the logo looks good alongside it. Now, when you're doing a series, the logo is going to be used over and over again on a whole bunch of different covers. But if you're doing just one, um, you've got the opportunity to sort of design the logo alongside the art and make sure that they look good together. Um, and that's something worth doing, uh, especially, like I said, if, you've, if you know it's only going to be used just this once for this one book. I'm a big fan of not designing the art or the logo in isolation. I'd like both to see both of them in a design together and make sure they're going to look good. Um, so that's something worth considering. Of course, as I said, once when you're doing a series and the logo is going to look, uh, uh, it's going to be combined with a whole bunch of different pieces of art, 
then uh, of course you just have to focus on making a good reusable logo that's going to look good with almost anything. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. And um, <clears throat> with this one, The Mighty Onion, it is in fact a two book series and so they have made it in a nice bold uh, way that can sort of be stamped on top of almost any design uh, that I come up with. Uh, but I thought I'd mention that. Uh, idea. Now one thing that I haven't put into my official group of eight different pieces of advice, consider this a bonus, <laughs> a little bonus piece of advice, um, and that is that sometimes you want to emphasize one word over another one. That is certainly the case with the mighty onion. Uh, they've decided to really focus on the word onion. Now uh, I can't give away too much about this project, it doesn't come out until April. But I can tell you that the Mighty Onion is the name of a superhero character. Um, this is not actually a superhero story, per se, but it involves uh, a sort of story within a story, and that's where we see this superhero character called the Mighty Onion. Uh, and um, maybe that's all I can say about that for now, but uh, rest assured. Uh, it, it involves humorous stuff, the whole vibe of this story, and that's why I think that, you know, this logo presents a feeling of adventure, I think with the letters leaning forward, you get this vibe of uh, forward momentum, action maybe, but then also sort of uh, fun, more than like really serious, gritty kind of a story. The colors, actually, are related to the color of the superhero costume. Uh, and I do believe that when Ann Dwyer came up with this logo design, in terms of the colors, she was looking at the costume design that I had come up with for this superhero and ma matching the colors of the logo to the costume. So that was a sort of interesting thing to see uh, that she did that. Let's move on now to this next piece of... Uh, advice, which is very personal to me. Number seven, if you use a handwriting font, consider tweaking any repeated letters so as to make it look more authentic. Now this one is a sort of a pet peeve of mine that certain fonts are made to look like human handwriting and yet naturally enough every letter is exactly the same uh, as you repeat them, and that kind of gives the game away. Let me show you a sort of series of books that I've done uh, in which I can point out to you uh, my efforts to take a font, which is what I based this on, uh, a handwriting looking type of a font. But like the letter S, uh, these two letters come right next to each other, and if I had just used the font as is, uh, hang on a second, because I think I need to refocus this. Uh, if I had used the font as is, these two S's would have been identical. And uh, as I said, that's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, that, um, that it gives away, it gives the game away when you're doing something that looks sort of like was done by hand. If you have two letters that are identical, even if they're not right next to each other, I think that sort of signals uh, to, to the viewer that um, this was not in fact handmade. Now like the word the contains the letter E and it is repeated here but I took care uh, if we zoom in to make that those make sure that those two letter E's <laughs> are not absolutely identical. I do believe that psychologically people can see uh, unlike this which clearly is a font this lowered little tagline here uh, I wanted the logo to look more authentically Hand drawn, and in the end, it was actually hand drawn, uh, but it was based on a font. And then I used that same font for uh, the comic book lesson a few years later. Again, sort of um, making sure that the two O's were not absolutely, or the three O's were not absolutely, four O's. <laughs> There's so many O's uh, were not absolutely identical uh, to each other. Uh, in any case. Using a font, when I'm using a font for logo design, I am certainly not using it straight out of the box. And let's just move right on to My Last Summer with Cass. Now this is a logo that I uh, basically designed. I think they gave me some uh, critiques of it. But this is a good one of where the S's are different, the A's are different. I'm making sure that it looks pretty legitimately like a handwritten 
font. And who knows, maybe I even fooled some people looking at that, thinking that it had nothing to do with a uh, font that I uh, just took. I think it's called Hillstone, that one uh, that I based it on. Lost in Taiwan, this is another one where Ann Dwyer at Little, Little Brown stepped in, but this one is clearly supposed to look like it's hand drawn. And uh, I, this time I was the one saying to Ann, can you make sure these two A's don't look exactly the same? These I's don't look, these N's don't look exactly the same, so that it, um, you know, conveys that feeling of having legitimately been done by hand. You can see I get a little nerdy, <laughs> a little obsessed about this idea of uh, not having repeated letters, if, especially if the two letters are right next to each other. Oh, you don't want them looking exactly the same. Uh, that is just going to show everybody that you uh, took a font right out of the box, basically, and uh, turned that into your logo. Well, we're getting closer uh, to the end of this. Let me take a little break here and I'm going to start adding, I'm going to finish up this coloring and then I'm going to start adding black ink to get us a little closer to the uh, finished product of this Mighty Un logo. All right, well, I think we're pretty much done uh, with this recreation of the Mighty Onion logo. Let this be a lesson to you. Don't try to do a logo like this by hand. It's so much easier to use a font, but I hope that it gave you something uh, visually interesting to look at as I dispensed all this advice. Speaking of which, we're down to the last one, number eight. Study logos you admire to understand how it's done. Of course, you can't copy them, but they can teach you the tricks of the trade. And I thought, as an example, I would show uh, one of the books I haven't shown yet, Billy Click, uh, my series of two books that I did, um, prose fiction novels. And you can see this silhouette here right in the middle of the Billy Click logo. That uh, was inspired by Jurassic Park, the logo where you see the, you know, the T-Rex in silhouette. Uh, so, you know, not an exact copy of Jurassic Park, but that idea of using a silhouette as part of the logo or part of the uh, sort of symbol of the, of the uh, project um, was indeed inspired. And you can see that this lettering here, very futuristic looking, as I said earlier, um, when you're trying to do, you know, this involves a lot of the story has a lot of high-tech gadgetry and so forth, so that type of uh, brushed steel futuristic looking logo was good for conveying the vibe of the project. But I do believe that brings us to the end of this video. Rest assured, I will be making videos uh, about the Mighty Onion as we get closer to release. Uh, early April, I think it's April 2nd, that this new project comes out, and I'll be looking forward to telling you more and more about it. Suffice to say, I personally feel it is one of the most unique and um, innovative projects that I've ever done. Um, and maybe I'll just leave it with that sort of tantalizing fact. But I think it's time for me to lay down this pen. I want to thank you all for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it, and I'll be back with another one real soon.